<laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Well, it's been uh, fun going through the book of Esther, and one of the things we noted uh, early on is that the name of God is nowhere mentioned in the book. And so, the, the main thrust of the book, as we discovered going through, is that even though he may be unseen and unheard, God is working. He's working through his people, he's working through uh, various other things to bring things about according to his good plan. And we, we even begin to sort of talk about the invisible hand that's always working in our lives. And I think all of us, if we're honest, and we've been Christians for any length of time, have had times in our lives where we've just wondered, where in the world are you, God? I'm having this dilemma, I'm in that dilemma, and you don't seem to be doing anything about it. And as we've gone through Esther, we've seen that God is where he always is, on his throne, directing these events towards the eventual consummation of his kingdom here on earth. So as we read, or as Tracy read for us this 10th uh, chapter, only three verses long, did you notice anything odd about it? Did, did you notice any name that's missing other than God's? Esther. Where in the world is Esther? We're talking here about honoring Mordecai, but this is the book of Esther. Why aren't we honoring Esther? She's not even mentioned. That's odd, don't you think? I mean, after all, uh, Esther was the, the big star, was she not? She was, yes. Where is she? Mordecai was sort of a second fiddle to Esther. Sort of a, a facilitator of Esther, if you will. So how come we have Mordecai here and not Esther? Well, I think it's something we often see in how God works. Taking nothing away from Esther now, God is taking the person who was more the facilitator, more the, the power behind the throne, if you will, and saying, I recognize what you've done, and I want to honor you. Now, he's in no way dishonoring Esther, but he is honoring Mordecai. Why is that important for us to know? Because again, in our lives, how often have we thought, well, I'm pretty insignificant in this big picture. I mean, I'm, I'm never going to be Chuck Swindoll or uh, whomever we want to pick. I, I'm just a person here plodding along, doing the best I can, uh, trying to support those who are the big stars in Christendom. Well, here's what we might find. And now I, I'm suggesting this. You know, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I, I won't be surprised if it does happen. I won't be surprised that if when uh, we come into God's presence, those people that were not particularly recognized for the things they were doing in God's kingdom here on earth are going to be recognized and honored by God. I, I, I believe that God enjoys exalting those whom do not expect to be exalted. Now, again, that's taking away nothing from the ones who have been exalted here on earth for the things they've done. Those are good things. I, I just think that God delights in honoring those who do not expect to be honored. And so we have Mordecai being honored. And he's being honored for his leadership. Some of you may be wondering, well, you titled this thing the mark of a great leader. Uh, where are you going? Well, we're going to kind of draw it together here, and we're going to see why it is that Mordecai is honored. And the first thing I want us to see is, is something we may not often think about, and that is, blessed are the peacemakers. 
Mordecai was a peacemaker. See? Now Jesus said that, right? Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. Right? Well, is peace something we need? I mean, if we had a show of hands, probably every hand would go up. I would love to have peace in my life. But what do we get? We get confusion, we get anguish, we get wars, we get rumors of wars. We get all of those things. And if we look back to chapter 3 of Esther, the last verse there, we begin... The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. And the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city was thrown into confusion. And then we read on, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out in the midst of the city and cried out with a loud and bitter cry. Isn't that an apt description of our world today. I mean, we're, we're pretty good in Camas and Washougal and Vancouver, wherever we are. But if you look at the world condition, I think confusion and anguish and wars and those sorts of things pretty well describe it. Now this isn't a new phenomenon. You go back to the beginning of time almost Genesis chapter 4 as soon as people begin to populate then what happens Cain kills Abel right out of the box boom we have brother killing brother and it's gone on ever since in one form or another do we need peacemakers I think we do and this is why when we find leaders that are peacemakers we honor them. Every once in a while, as you read history, you'll find that God raises up a man or a woman who literally changes everything. I can think of a few. Well, we, we, we might want to start as far back as the Old Testament book of Judges. And in Judges, if you're familiar with the book, we have uh, seven cycles of where the, 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 the Jews are in danger and they're being oppressed by other nations. And God will raise up a man or a woman, as in Deborah's case, and they will lead the nation to a place where they can have peace again. We can look at... at uh, more recent history. Uh, I think of George Washington. Now here was a guy you want to talk about uh, as the folks that say it pejoratively like to phrase it, a rich white man. And he was. He was extremely rich. He was obviously white and he was a man. Why would he risk his entire fortune in this foolish war against what was at the time the most powerful nation on earth. Why would he do that? He could have lived out his life in ease and luxury. He had it made. He had nothing really to gain. And yet he risked his life to go to war to make peace for the colonies. And we ended up with what we know as the United States. The United States rocked on really well well, with a few notable exceptions, and of course the biggest one would be the Civil War, right? The nation is being torn apart. So there's a guy named Lincoln. And, you know, there's pros and cons about Lincoln just as there is about anybody. But the fact of the matter is, Lincoln laid his life on the line in order to save the Union. Now he had to go to war to do that. And what we're going to find is that oftentimes in order to make peace, you have to go to war. And Lincoln did it, as we all know, at the cost of his own life. And we can speed along up into the 20th century, and when you think of peacemakers, well, a name that has to pop up on your radar right away is Winston Churchill. A great peacemaker. He had to go to war, though, in order to 
secure the peace. So whether from judges or the 20th century, all of these leaders, all of these peacemakers had a couple of things in common. They had to go to war to make peace and they were willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of their people. In chapter 10 verse 3 we read that Mordecai sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all the people. So we add Mordecai to our list, don't we? As being among the great peacemakers. But you remember Mordecai had to go to war in order to achieve this peace. Now we don't like that and I wish it were different but that's the way it is in our fallen world. Without Mordecai Esther never would have been in a position to approach the king. Mordecai had taken her in years before. You remember when her parents had died? He took her in and he raised her. Now, as we, we commented on through the book at various times, if we would have asked Mordecai when he had taken this young girl in and he was raising her, do you understand that you are raising up the person that's going to be put in a position to save the entire Jewish people? He would have laughed at us. He would have said, man, I'm just trying to make a living here and I, I've taken in this girl and I'm doing the best I can and it's hard, but we're getting by in a single father. It's hard, but we're making it. I don't think Mordecai would have ever thought, oh man, I'm, I'm raising the future queen who's going to be able to save my people. Now why is that important in our daily lives? It's important because you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> you have no idea what you're doing. You don't know if you're raising a future queen or a future king. Uh, you don't know if, if circumstances are going to come together next week, next month, next year, and you're going to do something absolutely fantastic beyond your wildest dreams or imaginations. Because one thing we learn in Scripture is God has a habit of taking the most unlikely people and elevating them to positions of great prominence so they can do great things for him. Esther becomes queen not just because of her good looks. You remember she was beautiful and that's why they took her and put her in the harem there to be a, a, a candidate for the queen. But in Esther chapter 2 verse 9 we get a little clue into what kind of a parent Mordecai was. If you look there, it says that she pleased Haggai, the head eunuch in, the, in the, the harem there, she pleased Haggai and won his favor. So what does that tell us about Esther? It doesn't say anything about he liked her because she was the best looking, does it? says she pleased him and won his favor. I think that means that Mordecai raised her to be respectful, uh, to uh, have some manners, to know how to approach people, to know how to talk to people, and Haggai recognized that. He spotted that. And you all know the same thing. You see it all the time. In fact, I, I, I saw it happen at the, at the gym here about six or eight months ago. They, they go through receptionists kind of like you change your, your shirts, you know. But anyway, uh, they hired this, this one gal and, and she was always dressed appropriately or better. And she always had a smile on her face and she always greeted you and about the third time you came through the door, she knew your name. And I thought to myself, well, she won't last long because there's a lot of business types come through the gym at that time of the morning. And sure enough, I'm in the locker room one time and, I, and I'm just talking to this guy and he just happens to be uh, an executive with Bank of America. And I, I said something about, isn't that receptionist out there great? And he said, yes, yeah, she is. Enjoy it because she's going to work for me next week. <laughs> you know? See, people recognize it when you 
speak appropriately, dress appropriately, and, and have some manners. Now, what does that have to do with getting, to go, getting into heaven? Nothing. But it has a lot to do with getting along here on this earth. And if we're going to be telling people about Jesus, we need to be appropriate. You know? So, I think Mordecai did a great job of parenting because he turned out a really great woman. Another thing Mordecai did in raising Esther, he instilled in her a great faith and a love for God. You remember when uh, Mordecai first proposed to her in chapter 4 that she go to the king? Oh, man, no. I don't want to do that. I'll lose my head. And that was a definite, not possibility, but probability. And yet, when Mordecai came back and challenged her and says, Yes, but what if God has put you here for just such a time as this? Oh. And she's willing to take the risk because she has great faith in God. And I'll tell you something about faith in God, that kind of faith in God. I think it's more, more a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego type of faith, you know, from the book of Daniel, when they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. This type of faith doesn't say, I'm going to go to the king because I know God won't let him take my head off. It's not what it is. It's this type of faith. It's what the, the three Hebrew children said to the king when he was about to throw them into the fiery furnace. They said, we don't know if God will deliver us from this furnace or not. But we do know he will deliver us from you. <laughs> Meaning, he may deliver them from the furnace. If he doesn't, he's taking them to heaven to be with him. And either way, they're okay. That's what that type of faith says. It, it's not a health, wealth, and prosperity thing where, you know, I know God's not going to ever let anything bad happen to me because we know bad things happen to us because we live in a fallen world. So Mordecai, I think, deserves a lot of credit here for turning out this kind of a woman. Mordecai sought the welfare of his people. Who are, here's a question for you, who are your people? Now, and I want you to think about that in two categories, near and far. Now, your people that are near are obvious. They're your kids, they're your aunts, your uncles, your, your husband, your wife, you know, the, the folks in your immediate circle. But there are also far people. And those are the people that you interact with every day. They can be your dentist. They can be the cop that stops you to give you a ticket. They can be whoever they are. How are you presenting yourself to those people? How are you investing in their lives? It's a good question. We want to be like Mordecai and have their interest at heart. So blessed are the peacemakers. But now we need to make another point. There's a difference, there's a vast difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. Most of us, our first inclination is we want to be peacekeepers. There are lots of peacekeepers out there and few peacemakers. Peacekeepers, you see, strive to keep the peace at any price. And on the face of it, or superficially, we might say, well, what's wrong with that? That's a good thing. Well, is it? They would tolerate a little evil rather than confront it and stamp it out. I'm going to tolerate just a little evil because it's easier to get along and go along than to stand up and speak up. Now, conflict for conflict's sake is always wrong. Let's say that too, okay? But so is peace at any cost. It's also always wrong on so many levels. You know, Edmund Burke, the uh, 18th century, 
said this, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. For good men to go along and get along is all that's necessary for the triumph of evil. You see, Mordecai, while he didn't have a great job, he was kind of a low-level civil servant, and he could have just kept quiet, left things as they were, and his life would have just kind of rocked on. If he would have just bowed down to Haman, well, what's the big deal about that? Haman goes by, he says, yeah, how are you? And, and things go on. Life goes on. But Mordecai couldn't do it. He had to stand up and speak up. He said, no, I'm not going to bow to you. I bow only to God. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Now, without getting too political on us, I don't like to get political, but we saw a great example of this last Wednesday. <coughs> There's no country on earth that had bent over more backwards to accommodate the Muslims in their country than France. France is the epitome of a go-along, get-along country. Peace at any cost. And yet, <clears throat> they had war. You see. And here's why. When you have a clash between good and evil, and good accommodates evil, evil never says, oh, what nice people, they're, they're willing to accommodate me. It never says that. It always says, oh, look at those fools. They let me come this far, they'll let me go that far. You see, it's like the bully on the schoolyard. The bully never ceases being the bully until somebody pops him in the nose. That's just the way it is. And that's the way it is in the bigger picture of good and evil. If your goal is peace at any cost, you will never achieve it. You can, you can take that to the bank, as they say. And the, the best example of this, a just glaring example of this, is uh, two men there in the, the 20th century, uh, Neville Chamberlain, who was the Prime Minister of England, and uh, Winston Churchill. And Chamberlain was the Prime Minister, and Hitler was on the rise in the late 30s. And in, in 1938, Chamberlain goes and meets with Hitler a couple of times, and his goal is to appease Hitler and stop his aggression. Now, the immediate thing was uh, Hitler wanted to bring in uh, a bunch of Czechoslovakia, annex it into Germany, etc., etc. So Chamberlain goes and meets with him, and Chamberlain is such a nice guy, and he talks so sweetly to Hitler, and Hitler talks nice back to him, to his face, but it's interesting to read about because as you read about the Munich meetings, that's where they took place, and also in, in uh, Hitler's uh, mountain private retreat, when Chamberlain would leave, Hitler would talk about him in the most degrading terms. They, they call him a, a sniveling umbrella car carrier. Now, that may not sound too insulting to us, but that was an insult for people. They were umbrella carriers. They were wimps, you know. It's like when you live here in the Northwest, you see somebody with an umbrella, you yeah? must be visiting from California. Yeah. You know. So, Chamberlain comes back, and of course, after the final meeting on September 30th, 1938, or September 29th, rather, 1938, he signed an agreement with Hitler. And Hitler promises to play nice. Comes home, plane lands, gets off the plane, makes his speech, and utters his famous statement. And he says, it goes like this, we have achieved peace in our time. Churchill's remark to that speech was, you have agreed upon peace, you shall have war. And that was September 1938. September 1939, 
Hitler unleashes the Blitzkrieg against Poland, World War II is underway, and depending on whose estimates you want to take, resulted in between 50 and 80 million people being killed in the course of that, that war. All because of very well-meaning, a very nice man thought that because he was nice, he could convince a very evil man to be nice. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. So, Chamberlain and Churchill are great examples of a peacekeeper and a peacemaker. Churchill went to war. But in the end, we had peace. Mordecai knew, as did Churchill, you cannot appease evil. Jesus knew that you could not appease evil. And as we go through his life in the book of Mark, we will see that he had no problem confronting evil. He gave no quarter to evil. He didn't try to play nice with evil. He confronted it. He called it what it was. You see, as Christians, sometimes we get the idea that we need to just let everything go. Don't speak up. We should never get angry because if we get angry, uh, we're, we're not being good Christians. And yet, we see examples where Jesus got angry, don't we? And we have, we have a direct word uh, from Paul. In fact, he even commands us to get angry. Right? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, what does he say? He says, be angry. But then he says, and sin not. So you can be angry and not sin. You see, evil should make us angry. When we see evil in the world, it should upset us. It should make us angry enough to want to uh, do something about it. But we must be careful. Because anger can be a very dangerous thing. And that's why James tells us the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Well, gee whiz, Pastor, you're schizophrenic up here. You're saying, be angry. You're saying, don't be angry. You're saying, angry's good, angry's bad. What's wrong with you? I don't have time to tell you all what's wrong with me. <laughs> but there's righteous anger and there's selfish anger. Being angry with evil is a righteous anger. Being angry and being moved to defend the defenseless is a righteous anger. Mm -hmm. Now, when our, our motivation for anger is, I've been hurt, I'm upset, I'm mad, I want to get even, that's not the kind of anger we want in our lives. So be sure you differentiate. And notice now, Paul says this. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean if I get angry at noon, I can only be angry till 5 o'clock or whatever time sundown is? Well, that would be a real literal interpretation of what he's saying, but that's not what he means. Here's what he means. And, I, and I've heard sermons on, well, what that means is if you and your wife have a fight, you should never go to bed angry. You need to settle it before you go to bed. Well, you might be up all night. You know? That's not what he means. What he means is this. Take action. Do something about the anger. Be a peacemaker. Settle it as quickly as possible. Don't let it fester and, and morph into something that you don't want it to be. So settle it as soon as possible. And if the anger is between you and your wife, if it's ideal, yes, to settle that before you go to bed. But you may, that may not always be possible. I was listening to R.C. Sproul the other day, and you know, man, as far as I'm concerned, he's one of the greatest Christians walking the earth today. And he was talking about anger. And he was talking about him and his wife, and they've been married forever, you know, because he's an old guy. And uh, he said that the problem is that he has with it is he gets angry, and she doesn't. And there's nothing that makes you more angry <laughs> when you're angry with somebody and they won't get angry back. Yeah, or, he says, if she does get upset with him, 
By the time she wakes up in the morning, she's over it, she's gone, and he still wants to drag this thing out, you know? So if Sproul struggles with this, we'll probably struggle with it too, but just know if righteous anger is good and proper, as long as it motivates you to do something about it, that will bring it to a conclusion, that will settle it. Well, finally, Mordecai is honored. We see that here in verse 2. And all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him are they not written in the book of the Chronicles. We can benefit, I think, greatly from seeing just what Mordecai is honored for. First, the obvious. He delivered his people from the threat of imminent death, didn't he? They were all going to be wiped out. Mordecai put himself and Esther, the, the daughter, not biological daughter, but practically speaking, the daughter that he raised and loved, I'm sure, uh, with all his heart, he put both of their lives in jeopardy for the welfare of his people. That's pretty hard to do to lay your life on the line for others. But that's what God calls us to do every day. See? We're to present ourselves as living sacrifices, to do the things He's called us to do. In Mark chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus, He calls the twelve together and He says to them, If any of you want to be first, you must be last, and you must be a servant of all. Now, how could that change our world? If all of a sudden, I don't know how many Christians there are, but there's a lot of us. If all of those Christians saw themselves as servants of others. So all the husbands are now servants of their wives. And all the wives are now servants of their husbands. And the children are servants of the parents, and the parents are servants of the children, and on and on it goes. The employees are servants of the employer, and the employers are servants of the employees. In other words, what if all of a sudden everybody started looking at those around them and asking themselves the question, how can I serve this person? How can I make this person's life better? Because what we often ask, though it's subconscious, I realize, is how can this person serve me? How can this person make my life better? It's just a, the effects of the fall. Second and not so obvious, Mordecai had great humility. You compare Mordecai to Haman. Haman was proud, self-serving, he, he demanded recognition. He demanded that his name be elevated. Mordecai just the opposite. He just took every opportunity to serve. And what happens here at the end of the book? Where's Haman? Well, he did, because they hung him. You remember that. And where's Mordecai? Well, Mordecai is being honored. He's the second most powerful man in the world now. He's the same place Joseph was in. Except Joseph was in Egypt. He's in Persia. There's a great piece of scripture here in Luke chapter 14. Now, this is Jesus, and he's telling a parable, and this is a great parable, but let me set it up for you a little bit. When we have uh, folks over for dinner now, it's usually a fairly informal affair. But in those days, when you had folks over for dinner, it was very formal, and there were very strict rules for where people sat. Now, we'd laugh at that, but not so in those days. And the, the head of the house sat at the head of the table. And the most important guest always sat to the right of the head of the house. And then, as on down the line, and the least important was clear down to the other end. Um, so Jesus tells this parable. Now, Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, 
When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come to you and say, Give your place to this person, and then you, you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence for all who sit at the table with you. He's saying don't seek the place of honor. Just go in and sit in the least honorable place and let the host then come to you and say, oh, wait a minute, I want a Jew up here. Mordecai was able to do that. Or as Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the right time God may exalt you. Mordecai was faithful over time. And he, so we see him go from a low-level bureaucrat to the king's advisor to second in command of the most powerful nation on earth. And again in Luke, you know, one who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. So you may think God has not got much of an agenda for you. He's not given you much. You don't have much. You may have nothing. Be faithful in your nothing. And because God is going to give you something. And he may give you a whole lot. We don't know. So here you go. Just to, to sum this up. A leader is a peace maker, not a peacekeeper. A leader has humility, he has faithfulness, he has loyalty, and has the good of his people ahead of himself. And if you live your lives that way, in whatever position you have, I firmly believe God is going to honor you for that. Because God isn't moved by position or amount or those sorts of things. He's moved by humility, loyalty, and faithfulness. And if you can, you can pull that off, I think God is going to be well pleased with you. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the great uh, book of Esther, Lord, and for the lives of Mordecai and uh, all of the people that we looked at. And we just pray that you would help us to have hearts more like theirs, Lord. And, and we're not bad people. We're all doing the best we can with what we have. But we would pray that your Holy Spirit would fill us in such a way that we can do better. That we can take uh, stewardship over the things you have given us. And that we can treat the people around us in a way that you would be pleased with. And we know your words are so familiar that we should become the servant of all. Very difficult for us, Lord. So we ask that you would extend us your grace and your mercy and allow us to rise to the level of servants. In Jesus' name, amen.